Hello, and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our fourth talk out of five about entirety. So we're looking at how to relate to reality and breaking it down according to the venerable four element system of earth, water, air, and fire. So this fourth session will be about relating to the so-called air element. And we'll be focusing on how to be mindful in our bodies in a way that fosters a sense of compassion and acceptance of the difficulties of life that, that we face both individually and collectively. From a physical standpoint, the air element can be matched with the gaseous phase of matter. We looked at H2O in the solid and liquid talks, or the earth and water talks, and we saw how water can exist as ice, of course, and it can exist as liquid water, of course, and we also know that it can exist as vapor or steam. When it's in the vaporous form, the molecules are quite independent one of one another, kind of zipping around without much interaction. So there's the solid phase with the molecules in relatively fixed positions. They're vibrating around a bit, but they're not uh, changing locations very much. And when the water is in that vaporous state, they're far apart from one another, no longer having any fixed position, zipping around quite rapidly and interacting only on occasion. Now, a gas that's maybe more important to us on a moment-to-moment -moment basis is the oxygen that we breathe, comprising about 21% of the atmosphere, every time we breathe in, oxygen en enters our lungs and then enters our bloodstream and allows our cells to do what they do to keep us alive. So we, we have these organs in our chest cavity that we call lungs. And we'll look a little bit at how these work in this talk. But first, let's look at the atmosphere itself which of course is connected to the earth, wrapped around the surface of the planet. It forms a thin layer on the surface of the planet as seen here, that thin blue line. And you can see how relatively narrow it is. For a planet that's roughly 8,000 miles in diameter, the atmosphere is only you know, perhaps 10 miles thick, where it consists of you know, any significant amount of uh, air. In the movie, An Inconvenient Truth, former Vice President Al Gore pointed out that if we shrunk the earth down to the size of a billiard ball, the atmosphere would be about the thickness of the varnish on the surface of that ball. So very thin. The Earth has quite a few layers inside of it. There's a core, there's a mantle, there's a crust. The outermost layer of the Earth isn't actually the crust, however, it's the atmosphere itself. So the atmosphere is actually a layer of the planet. It's a gaseous layer, layer sure, but it's still part of the planet. So that when we live on the surface of the rocky crust, we're living in the midst of this outermost layer of the planet, the atmosphere. So it's not so accurate to say that we live on Earth. It's more accurate to say we live in it because we're in this outermost layer. This is a point that was made by the eco-philosopher David Abrams in one of his books. In that sense, we are very similar to fish in the way we move through the atmosphere. We're surrounded by this medium. We take it for granted, of course, but it's there all the time, and we're utterly dependent on it. Humanity wouldn't last more than five minutes if the atmosphere suddenly disappeared. 
So breathing is an important act. And most of the time we breathe relatively automatically without a lot of conscious attention to it. But of course we can bring more mindfulness into our breathing as this young man is doing with a Qigong style of breathing. Very deliberately moving the whole body with the breath, drawing the air in and pushing it out. We'll see as we proceed through this talk that the atmosphere and the air element bring in qualities of being shared and intimate and vulnerable. So from a shared standpoint, many other animals and also other organisms on Earth make use of the atmosphere for their survival. In fact, the vast majority of them do. There are a few bacteria that don't depend on the atmosphere so much, but other than that, everything else does. So if we look at a familiar animal like a polar bear, a fellow mammal, of course it has lungs inside with which it breathes. And we can look at fish of various sorts and sharks that live underwater, and they have gills. And they are breathing by virtue of oxygen exchange from the atmosphere above the water. Some animals, like amphibians, absorb oxygen right through their skin. And then insects have an interesting system of little tubes and channels that bring the oxygen deep into their bodies. So all of these animals have ways of bringing oxygen in just as we do. Plants also have ways of bringing the atmosphere in. In this case, they use oxygen at night, but during the day they use carbon dioxide along with sunlight to combine water and carbon dioxide together to form carbohydrates or sugars. So there's a way for the air to get into the plant just as there's a way for air to get into our bodies. As we magnify the leaf, we can see getting larger and larger that it has on its undersurface these little openings called stomata. And these actually have little cells around them that regulate how open they are. They can be closed completely or they can open fairly widely depending on the plant's needs and how dry it might be and whether the plant needs to be careful about conserving water, etc. So plants bring carbon dioxide deep into their tissues when they photosynthesize. We bring oxygen deep into our tissues with every breath and we have this ongoing cycle. So we bring in oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide, plants bring in a lot of carbon dioxide, a little bit of oxygen, and then they release a lot of oxygen back to the atmosphere and the whole thing maintains a balance and life continues. Of course, humanity is altering that balance quite a bit with our uh, you know, burning of various uh, fossil fuels and other substances. Those uh, exhaust fumes get out into the atmosphere and alter its composition with effects that we're aware of. The main point here, though, is that anything that goes into the atmosphere is, is essentially shared by everything on the planet. The atmosphere mixes fairly rapidly, stuff spreads uh, fast, and we're all kind of sharing this layer of Earth within which we live. So either in a formal sitting meditation practice or simply when you have a moment to yourself to pause and reflect, you might want to pay attention to your breathing and contemplate how the air that you breathe is shared with all other life on Earth. And that the oxygen that keeps you alive came from photosynthetic organisms, plants and plankton, and that the carbon dioxide you exhale will help keep those organisms alive. So there's this ongoing cycle of shared atmosphere. So we have these organs in our bodies that we call lungs. They fill our chest cavity. Air moves down the windpipe and reaches a point where that airway divides and then the main bronchi that come off divide again and again and again and again and again and the little airways get smaller and smaller and smaller until at their very, very tips they terminate in these little air sacs. 
these little alveoli, as they're called, that you've probably heard of. Now, the air sacs have a very thin membrane around them. It's just two very thin cells thick. And on one side is the atmosphere, the air that we breathe, and on the other is the blood supply, little capillaries wrapped around the air sacs. So this gives a moist, thin membrane across which oxygen can leave the atmosphere and enter the blood where it's picked up by hemoglobin. And carbon dioxide can leave the blood, enter the little air sacs, and be exhaled uh, on a later breath. We can animate this a bit and show the blood flowing by the air sacs and oxygen entering the blood and carbon dioxide leaving it. This is a very simple animation, but it makes the point that there are molecules moving in and out in this way. And of course, we can combine this sense of how deep into our bodies the air penetrates and how it gets to the point where it's just this very thin membrane away from the bloodstream and how all of these other organisms are using the same atmosphere. And then we can begin to touch on this feeling of intimacy, how the atmosphere intimately enters our body and gets way inside and very close to our bloodstream, and how by sharing this atmosphere with so many other organisms, we are having an intimate relationship with them as well. So there's the shared quality and the intimate quality of the air element, the atmosphere. To get a further handle on just how intimate all this is, the surface area of all those air sacs is surprisingly large. Even though each air sac has got a volume inside not much more than the size of a grain of salt, when you have millions and millions of them, the surface area becomes quite large. In fact, if you're familiar with the size of a king-sized bed, which I think most of us can kind of picture, the surface area that allows for gas exchange deep in our lungs is equivalent to about 16 such beds. So again, intimate. So now other organisms that use the atmosphere are also intimately connected with it including plants. So we can zoom in in this animation and see what happens inside the leaf after we pass through those little stomata, the openings in the leaf mentioned earlier. So here we are zooming through into a stoma. And we can see the substance of the plant inside and pretty quickly we get inside the cells and way down deep inside and we see these little discs and this is where the chlorophyll is. And there's this incredible activity on the surface of these discs, these little whirling molecular organ systems that are converting sunlight to chemical energy that organisms, including the plants themselves, can use. So the oxygen gets way into the plant tissue and way into the plant cells just as it gets way into our bodily tissue and way into our bodily cells. There's this cliche of the so-called plant hugger, kind of left over from the hippie era in the 1970s, this sense of you know, being a little goofy and going out and hugging trees. And yet the breath that we take moment by moment is, if anything, a lot more intimate and brings us a lot closer in a certain sense to plant life than we would even if we went right up to a tree and hugged it. Because we are sharing the atmosphere with these plants and benefiting from the oxygen that they release from deep within their cells. This oxygen travels through the atmosphere and then penetrates deep into our own cells. Very intimate. So here's a nice image that captures the idea of intimacy. And again, if you have a sitting meditation practice or just when you have a moment to yourself to sit and tune into your breathing and contemplate it a bit, you might want to give some attention to how intimate the breath process really is 
how deeply into your body the atmosphere enters and how your cells eventually absorb the oxygen that's in the atmosphere that itself was released from the tissues and the cells of plants and plankton and other photosynthetic organisms. So going back to the intimacy, of course, with intimacy, there comes vulnerability. The COVID-19 pandemic made us very aware of this. All of a sudden, everyone's wearing masks to protect themselves from the way we share and are intimately connected through the atmosphere. So there is a kind of vulnerability that goes right along with all this. Vulnerable. And of course, we know how vulnerable we are to a deprivation of the atmosphere. We can't stay underwater for very long without it beginning to feel extremely uncomfortable and ultimately quite frightening. So we are very vulnerable in the, sen in the sense that we are so dependent upon being able to breathe quite a few times a minute. When Al Gore showed how thin the atmosphere is around the earth, he was making a point about vulnerability. He, of course, in that movie, An Inconvenient Truth, was talking about climate change, global warming, as it was often called back then. How the accumulation of carbon dioxide from burning fossil fuels is heating the planet. And one of the reasons there's such a risk is that the atmosphere is so very thin that there's only a limited amount of volume to it and we fill it with unneeded gases, excess carbon dioxide at our peril. And of course we pump all sorts of stuff into the atmosphere uh, through our industrial processes. And this leads to what we call air pollution coming from factories and of course also automobiles and, and lots of other technologies. And simultaneously, we are altering the vegetation that would ordinarily absorb a lot of the excess carbon dioxide and cleanse the atmosphere. So not only are we degrading the air by releasing stuff into it, we're also reducing the ability of the planet to clean that atmosphere and remove carbon dioxide and so on. So again, we are vulnerable by virtue of the shared and intimate quality of the atmosphere. This is all tied together. And here we face these uh, heat waves that pass over the planet, the droughts and the intense storms and the potential for rising sea levels and the loss of Arctic and mountain glaciers and on and on and on. There's all these changes because of the vulnerability. Now, there are other reasons why we feel vulnerable and at risk that don't really have to do with the atmosphere per se, but they do kind of touch the air element. Within Chinese medicine, the lungs are actually considered to be repositories of grief so that when people suffer losses, it's not surprising to a Chinese medicine physician if they suffer some kind of respiratory ailment. So there's a sense of which the chest cavity and the lungs feel our sorrow and feel our fear and connect us with this real and ongoing quality of being vulnerable as organisms. You know, life has a vulnerability to it. There's no doubt, especially individual organisms are quite vulnerable. They don't last forever. It's not that hard to damage them or even deprive uh, their, them of the capacity to continue living. And so vulnerability is built into life and we feel it most directly through this so-called air element. As an aside, I would also say that the thinking process has a kind of airy feel to it. So that as we look at images of distressing activities around the world, the destitution, people living on the streets, the wars, the ecological destruction, uh, 
And we start to worry about what's coming. And of course, we've got lots of personal worries too. But that worry is in a way related to the air element in how kind of windy and shifty thoughts can be and how when they get really going, they can be kind of destructive, like hurricanes or what have you. So that's another dimension of the air element in the human experience is the airiness of our thinking. And you know, it can be a pleasant process to imagine and have a fond memory. That would be like a nice, warm summer breeze. Uh, but it can also be quite stormy, of course. And, you know, we can feel traumatized by it, as well as by actual events in the world that actually are, are windy, stormy thinking processes can lead to a sense of just being kind of battered. And not that there isn't a lot more to trauma than our thoughts, but one of the consequences of the hardships of life is a kind of difficult thinking experience. And, you know, there's nothing very surprising in any of this. Uh, we're all aware of it. I'm just kind of stating the obvious and tying it with the air element. So all that stuff gets into our brains so to speak, and we get this storminess going on. Well, in the ideal, as we learn to become more mindful, there is a remedy to all that. And that's to kind of step back and take a broader perspective and begin to look at the world that distresses us and even our own mental experience as if from, you know, quite a distance away so we can get some perspective, get some relief from being right in the middle of the storm. And we can remember that there is a kind of swirling activity that's always ongoing in reality and on earth and in the atmosphere and in our lived experience. Currents moving this way and that, storms forming and resolving the whole planet, this wide view, all this activity, always happening, always changing. You know, we can begin to see that this is just the way life is. It's not that unusual that we would you know, have difficulties in our lives or be frightened or sad. That's just normal. Okay? And we can look at it as a kind of changing and shifting weather pattern rather than taking it so personally. So again, you know, I don't need to remind anybody that life can be difficult and sad and scary and so on. But we could also, in addition to being aware of all that, notice that it has a kind of parallel with the shifty, changing weather patterns that are you know, always swirling and stormy somewhere with everything kind of coming and going, some areas cloudy, some areas light. And, and this is sort of the nature of reality and lived experience. You know, this is my opinion. Uh, for what it's worth, but that's what I'm trying to suggest here in this class is that we look at these parallels between human experience and global phenomena. And so we can begin to see that even our own mental experiences have this global uh, weather pattern, things coming and going. And we can hold all this and we can add in not just the air element, which reminds us of how flowing and swirling and you know, what a kind of climatic experience it is to have a human body and a human mind, but we can also remember that there's a kind of watery quality to life as well, particularly uh, as we said in the uh, abdomen where there's all that digestive movement going on in the intestines and so on. And, we have the surging quality of the passions and emotions. You know, that's all quite watery. And then there's the stability of the earth qualities in the body, the big, stable bones, the strong, you know, substantial muscles are quite earthy and supportive. And all of this together can add to the feeling of you know, taking a long view and a wide perspective to know that there's this power of the liquid elements in our body, the water element, that there's the stability of the earth, et cetera. And then we can begin to hold all of our experience, the difficulties, both collective and individual. 
shared, intimate, and vulnerable. It's worth bringing in at this point the archetype of the Christian crucifix. This is a crucifix made by tribes people in the Congo. And of course, they were influenced by the missionaries and adopted some Christian practices and belief systems. But it seems to me that they wove the standard Christian story into their own tribal sensibility. And this crucifix, not only does it look uniquely and you know, strongly African in flavor, it also is a little ambiguous about the sex of this individual. It could be a man, it could be a woman. So there's a sense in which they have been creative with the basic story they were given by the missionaries and woven it into their own tradition, which I find quite appealing. And it also shows that they found some real importance in this image of a essentially a kind of godlike uh, spirit who person who paid a heavy price for his belief systems and his leadership and did so in a way that provided meaning. So the Christ archetype, which I have always felt rather attracted to, even though I don't consider myself Christian, helps us see that there can be a salvational quality in our individual difficulties in the world. And so that can help us hold the vulnerable features of the air element as well. And in addition, there's a strong emphasis on a kind of vast and almost superhuman forgiveness that goes along with the Christ archetype. After all, some of the last words Christ is purported to have spoken is, forgive them, Lord, they know not what they do. And we can look out upon this planet with all of its difficulties and all of its madness and be at least somewhat forgiving for all of the confusion that's driving people to behave in such counterproductive ways. So this sense of finding some meaning even in the difficulty while forgiving ourselves and others for how confused we feel and how that confusion often drives us to unfortunate behaviors. And so we have come to the end of this talk about the air element and again, if you sit in meditation or just while relaxing sometime, you might want to bring all this together, the shared, the intimate, the vulnerable aspects of your experience. Hold it in your heart, in your chest area, and feel some compassion for yourself and everybody else who's struggling with this, and perhaps see if there isn't some sense in which all of it is helping you gain clarity and wisdom. I suggest this because this is how I operate uh, often, and I have found it helpful, and I hope you will too. So thank you for watching this. There will be one more episode or session covering the fire element.